I wanted to be in the exhibit. Um, death has always been a subject that has interested me from the time I was a child, just in, it was so abstract as a child. Um, and then uh, when I had my children, I have two children, a boy and a girl, and when I had them, a very good friend of mine had her children at the same time. And when she was pregnant with her second child, she lost that baby in the seventh month of her pregnancy. And it was devastating for her because her husband and her mother didn't want to talk about it. So we talked about it and we talked about it all the time in so many different ways. And her biggest fear was that she was going to lose her daughter, her older child. And she went on to have another child. And when he was 18, he was killed in an accident. So again, no one wanted to talk about it, but we did. So death and to do with memory and children was very, although it's not my personal experience, it has been the experience of people that are very close to me. And the number one thing that we talked about that bothered her was when people would say they didn't get to live a full life. And we would talk about what, what is meant by a full life and who judges that and how do they determine what is full and what isn't. Is it a series of boxes we have to tick of things that we've done? Or can a life be full if it's only a moment? Or, or not even in the case of her unborn baby. Mm -hmm. so, so those were things that were very important to me. And she was always trying to preserve her memories. And we talked about how you do that. So my work is very much wrapped up in how you deal with your memories, good memories, bad memories keeping them, cherishing them, sharing them, what you share, what you don't. Um, and then also at what stage of life different people intersect with death because it happens along the whole spectrum. So it was thinking a lot about that and how <clears throat> at what point would people stop saying that you know, they didn't live a full life. And that when older people pass, it's often said that they did live a full life. And so it's not as bad. And I've just found the whole thinking of that very interesting. So that was kind of what my work was based on. The catalyst was the memory plaques at McGuire Lake. Um, walking there with my stepfather who has dementia and is now in a care home. Um, and, and looking at the words that people chose to remember the people in their lives that mattered to them. And when the exhibit, what really drew me to it was when you first posted it, it was called Death and Taxes. And I started thinking that how, the words people choose to remember us are kind of a tax that we pay for the life we've chosen to live. And it made sense to me. And I really liked that idea that if other people are choosing those words, it's based on their perception of you. And if you're choosing, choosing those words yourself, it's what of your life do you want to be remembered for long after everybody that would know you is gone. I thought that was really interesting. So my work started with those thoughts and then it developed from there. And because I was inspired by the plaques at the lake, I wanted to bring the lake into my work. So I did a lot of research um, with the flowers, the, the flora. Um, <clears throat> I loved the imagery of the cattails and I had worked previously with preserving plant material and then weaving with it. And I, I found that quite interesting. It was almost like an embalming, if you will. And so the cattails were a, a good choice for that. And I thought I could use them in bring them in quite easily. I think the hardest thing for me was for a long time I resisted bringing the flowers into the work at all. It felt too simple. It felt um, almost not serious enough and for whatever reason I don't understand it took me a long time to make the connection of flowers and funerals and um, once I made that connection and acknowledged it and said well duh basically um, it became a lot easier for me. So I started doing a lot of research and I found things that were, to me, that were so interesting about them. Um, 
that cattails are a, are a bridge between things that are often at a discord. So our private memories and our public face to those memories can not always match up either in good ways or bad ways. Um, we, we might protect memories that we simply don't want to share or we can't share. Um, you know, we might want to forget the bad and remember the good. That's, that's often a, a thing for people. So, so that was interesting. Um, I found out that in, in a lot of native cultures, indigenous peoples cultures, um, roses were a charm against ghosts and spirits of the dead. Uh, so that was interesting to me. So looking at those meanings and then playing with the plant materials. Um, so one of the things that I did was I, I took cattails and I left them just as they were, cut the ends off and used them so this is just a prototype of the vessel. But when I made these, those are stamped with the cattails, with the straight edges of them, and brought that in as a tool for what I was doing. So that was, that was interesting. Um, I collected water from the lake for the watercolor painting that I did, um, and the cattails obviously were woven into the, the one vessels base, and then the other one with the cattails coming up the side. They form the base of that. So that was sort of what I was thinking about and how I went about it in the three different vessels, just quickly. The first one with the cattails, um, the cloth one, silk, paper. I wanted to use very fine, very special materials that um, signified how important the things that, it, you know, the memories were to people. Um, silk is very strong and it will stand on its own. So I thought that, it, you know, it was a good choice metaphorically as well. When I did the taller one, that was when I started doing a lot of research into shrouds and shrouds for protection and containment of the body before coffins came into use. And the thought of wrapping our memories in a shroud with the knots to protect. Um, so, so the first one I called in my mind preserve because it was preserving the memory and putting it into the memorial plaques. The second vessel with the cattails on the outside from the weaving of the base and then forming up the visuals of the cattails on the side, that was protect. And that was memories that we really want to protect. And it's not that they're, they can't be shared at all, but we only share maybe part of them. So for that one, I took the strips of cloth that I was using for the shrouds. I, I had laid my hands on some 110 year old hand loomed, hand spun hand loomed linen. And I thought that was a perfect fabric, especially because it was made by hand. So handwork tends to be considered to be quite special. Um, and you can just imagine people weaving their shrouds ahead of their death. It was very common to do that. Um, and I stitched words that either were taken directly from the plaques, like loved. Um, and then I took words that were inferred by the memories on the plaques and I embroidered them. And when I formed the vessel, I formed it so the, the legible side of the word was facing inside and the wrong side of the stitching was facing outside so that it was clearly visible as a word but not readily apparent. And that alluded to um, containing those, keeping those memories safe. Um, but not hidden. And then the final vessel that I did was contain, and that was memories that are just too big to let out. Again, neutral, good, bad. It's regard irregardless, regardless of um, whether they're good or bad, they just need to be contained. So that one, all the words are on the inside, 
none of them face out. And then the imagery of the flowers was to do with protection, pain, um, strength, and they were chosen for those reasons. Um, and the base of that fabric was made with scraps of cloth that were all hand stitched together. And that was done in a technique um, taken from Japan. It's called boro. And it's where things are too precious to let go of. Mm -hmm. And they used usually the cloth from clothing um, to make those and preserve that, um, honoring, honoring the life of the cloth and keeping it going for as long as you can. And so that patching, I used staples on there as if you were in a hurry trying to close something up and not let anything out. There's patches that were applied over the top again as if those thoughts were trying to burst out but you simply could not let them. So that was kind of what I was going after there. For the book, that was how we measure a life. So the one side, I have a prototype here, the side that's like this with all of the stitched marks as for counting, um, that was because we measure life um, hours, sometimes days, weeks, months, years. We measure it we measure it in tick marks, we measure it in um, numbers, you know, on a, tomb, on, a, on a tombstone or a memorial plaque, the to and from date. So that's one way of measuring a life. And then the other way of measuring a life is how wide it is, how full it is, and where those two connect, as I said earlier. And when I did that, um, a friend of mine said, well, you don't have to do anything on the other side. When I, I said to her, well, I've got this side done and I love it, but I'm not sure what I want to do on the other side. And she said, don't do anything. That can be enough. It's just about how we measure a life. And I said, but it's not the only way we measure them. And I find it interesting where they connect and, and where the judgments are made based on those connections. And so when I made this, all the pages were an equal length. And when I looked at it, I thought, but our lives aren't. So the pages need to be different because a page is a page. It can be a short page or a long page, but it's a, a page is a page. And um, so I changed how I folded them and that's why they're all different sizes to represent the different lengths of life. And then I thought about based on the plaques where they might in a life journey be inferring um, where the person was when, when they passed. And so I started working with imagery that I thought um, gave that message. So for example, the first one, um, I used quotes from the plaques. That one is, we're golden. And I did the dandelion. That one to me represented childhood. It was one of the first things I remember, and I think a lot of people remember as far as nature goes, is blowing a dandelion. Um, and the word golden to golden years of childhood, it's something we look back on fondly. And, you know, that can often be something put towards the end of life for people who have lived for a very long time, the golden years. But to me, that was, that was childhood. And I just worked my way through all the different stages of life stages where might pe people might be when they, when they die and tried to tell a story of that connection using the materials from the lake. Um, for the last one with the sails, I buried cloth in the backyard for six months under the roots of a sage plant and I pulled it out and it was totally decimated, but it was beautiful in that and painted it and and applied some of it to the page. And just trying to think about things like that and bring them into the work. Um, yeah, I just kind of did that all the way through with, with the various elements. I think I've run out. <laughs> I tried a lot of things that didn't work. I spent a lot of time on it. 
um, just experimenting with so many different approaches. Um, I've never done anything like this before. So it was a real challenge. Um, I think when I was struggling the most was with the, with the book. Um, and then I realized through talking again to, to my friend that what I was doing was conceptual. And conceptual art is probably the most difficult. Interpreting a mountain or doing something about trees is, I don't mean to belittle it, but it may not be quite as difficult as something like what we've been doing here, where we're trying to deal with conception, perception, and, and things like that. So that was the real challenge for me, was to make something that it, it tells the story, but it leaves people room to see what matters to them in it and what they can take from it, rather than laying it all out um, and not letting the viewer find something in it that connects with them. That was, that was difficult. It was a wonderful experience. I, I loved making and thinking and trying to tie it all together. There was a few aha moments and there was more than a few struggles where I could not figure out how to visually present what I was thinking. But eventually, eventually I felt like it, it came out okay. Um, it's hard to know where to begin. <laughs> so my piece is called Womb, and um, when I first saw the um, the proposal for the pro the show, I knew it was something I really wanted to to take part in. Um, I was also a couple months into um, my life with my my daughter, um, so I was kind of postpartum and feeling all of the things all at once, um, and a lot of it was was grief because here I had all of these days and weeks with this beautiful perfect baby that I didn't have with my my other pregnancies that I'd had before. Um, so I guess I should talk a little bit about that so there's some background. Um, in 2016 I had a, a baby girl um, at 26 weeks and she she did pass away because there were a lot of complications that came from being born that early. Um, and it was shattering. It, it knocked us out completely. Um, we, we'd had a few days with her, but the, the anticipation beforehand and the lead up and, you know, you, when you decide to have a, a baby, that dream itself is, is huge and all consuming. And it's not just the individual days that you have the pregnancy or the baby it's this whole lifetime that you've imagined and dreamed of for that person um so to have this thing that i literally thought about every minute <laughs> for the last you know uh six seven months before that suddenly just disappear it was it was very um hollowing i guess like like what's left when when this thing that you've gone all this love for just disappears um and then at the same time it, it felt like she was still very much with us um and i guess part of that would be spending most of the time that i had with her she was she was a part of me so it's it's a hard thing to kind of accept and for your body to accept that it's it's no longer there um and then after that we had some pretty bad years where we, we kept trying to have a kid and um, we lost quite a few pregnancies in the middle of it. Um, and then eventually three years later, we were able to have a healthy girl um, who also was premature and spent some time in the hospital and we weren't sure if she was gonna make it or not. And um, so anyway, so I was at the end of that crazy four years and I, I had this baby and she was healthy and she was great. And then I just was kind of overcome with guilt that I, I had been stuck in this place for so long that I had been 
kind of really deepen the grief for years and years and it was hard to let go of because with every pregnancy and every loss it just throws you right back to the beginning and um and now I was on the other side of it but it felt kind of insincere to the person that I'd become for the few years before that if that makes sense um so anyway all these things were going on in my head when I saw the proposal so I knew that I needed to make something and I knew that I needed to make it more about more than just be about the the sadness and the grief of it I wanted to do something that really honored each of those babies the pregnancies and kind of um, tied it all together and included them all in a way that was more of um, like a celebration than it was a mourning um, that <laughs> works. Uh, so I wanted, I knew I needed to do something that uh, was, it's hard to explain, I guess. <laughs> um, I was trying to put all of these really intense feelings and uh, relationships and uh, what it meant to be a mother to that child and all of these other children all at once. And um, this piece is what I came up with. There's uh, six layers to it of, um, of wood and then uh, a transparency in between each of them. Um, and each of those represents one of the pregnancies and they get gradually larger as they go outwards. Uh, and the smallest ring is the length of my first daughter at her birth. And then the largest ring was the length of my my last daughter at her birth. And I, I did that because I wanted to kind of convey the the journey of it, I suppose. So it's um, it, it all becomes very interweaved. Um, but then I feel like all of those losses kind of set the stage for the final homecoming of, of our daughter. Um, and when I first set out, I wanted to have each of the layers kind of represent a feeling that I had during each of the pregnancies. But as I made the, the work, it all kind of just weaved in and out of each other. There's three layers that are all about my firstborn, where I, I have different um, parts of her kind of transcend outside of the, the center of it. And I think a lot of that is just how those miscarriages in between the two babies that I got to meet, um, they were their own person, but then they also reflected the other, the other children. Um, I have layers that are flowers and um, I, we spoke about that earlier too, how the flowers are, you, you get a lot of flowers when somebody dies, um, but you also get a lot of flowers when somebody is born. Uh, and my first daughter's middle name was Rose too, so I, I knew that um, I wanted to include something floral in there because uh, for a while there when I didn't have her, I would look for signs of her places and flowers often gave me a lot of comfort um, feeling like there's some connection there between uh, this baby that I've lost and the, the things that are around me in the moment. <laughs> um, I also have a layer of, of tree branches that uh, kind of mimic veins and um, that sort of thing because the, the vessel itself is round and spherical and I wanted to reflect um, like a, a pregnant belly or a womb but also tie it into a natural um, landscape because these children went back to the earth but then the earth is living. So in, in a sense, they're living through that earth. Um, and I think the same thing with the flowers too. I wanted to have these kind of frozen uh, time lapses of these flowers that were here, but they're not anymore, but they kind of are <laughs> because they're preserved in some way. Um, and I guess that's just kind of echoed a lot of the feelings that I had about each of these children, especially the ones that I lost very early before I really was able to, to uh, get to get to know them in the same ways that the later loss and my living child I was able to um, because it was really just like a, a concept and a feeling and then it was over and then it was echoed every time I had a miscarriage. Um,
So my story actually goes back to 20, well, 25 years ago now, um, 1995, when I lost my year and a half year old daughter in a family picnic. And um, at the time she went missing, there was this dreadful feeling that I thought I had created it because it was like I had my own near-death experience, but it was actually Leah's journey, but I felt it at that level. I had thought she'd went to the water, she loved the water, and but we didn't really know for sure. And there was mayhem for two hours until she was found. But as I said, during that initial first half hour, there was these images that flashed through my mind that were paintings that I had made, things that I said, even that day, eight hours earlier, I said, I've nursed Leah the longest. I had to keep her the closest to me. She's my third child. And there she was eight hours later gone. And there were things that I recalled at this very intense moment in my life and most intense that I had written and um, thought so you know knowing that I was had this um, at the same time she is assumed gone to the water and lost to us I was feeling this connection to maybe something greater here but in this in most grieving way and similarly my body started going into kind of um, labor pains. So it's like I had this labor pains of birthing her death. So uh, it was all very intense time period. And then the movement through that journey of the first year was the, probably, I think back now, the most challenging. And through that first year, there was two other children that I had with my husband. So I needed to be mom to James and to Kara. Um, James was just four and Dakara was just going to be six. We we're running a business, but through that first year, I, I, um, did some writing and, um, and also some artwork. And through that process, I realized that I wanted to have a show with these artworks that I had made. And a number of them were made in art school, made eight years prior to her, her being born. And the image that's on the book cover, this painting, um, it's a crop of a painting, but the painting is actually this one. Um, you can see this child in the water, this dark, this shape coming out of the sky, this moon. And, and um, my supervisor at the time thought, what are you doing painting children? You're in art school. Let's you know, that's uh, pretty dangerous territory, but he said the painting worked because of this mysterious shape coming out of the sky. And as it was when she left us, this was her last picture. So she's got dark hair, high forehead. She's up the age of that toddler would have been. So that was the first painting that started the exhibition that I had. And then I followed through with these other artworks that I had um, made that I felt had this connection and then gave descriptions with each of these pieces at the art exhibition. And then I had made a few other pieces during that first year grieving that I had in the show. So it was my way to celebrate her life and to honor it and to thank all the people who were really, you know, supported us through their love in all sorts of different ways. Um, and also to really maybe present as best I could at the time, the conversation about maybe what Julian was speaking with in the sense of, and maybe as well, Elizabeth, you talked about, uh, Julian was more about the value of a life and a life well lived, um, whether it be, you know, three days, one and a half years, 18 years, who are we to say 60 years, but also, is there a destiny, right? Is there is there a, a time that we are to come for this experience and then leave again? And so all that was wrapped up in my head and with more to say, but I just had the exhibition 
1996, so a year after her passing. And then life took over, right? A mom running a business. And I always had it in the back of my head. I wanted to write the full story because there was more than the artworks that I wanted to fill in, the gaps of just, like I said, things I, I said, did, wrote. So it was time two years ago to kind of put the time in to get the book wrote. And, um, and the, this uh, publication, I decided to go through Balboa Press, which is a division of Hay House. And I've read lots of authors from Hay House. They're a big genre publication house. And you might have read some authors, Deepak Chopra, um, Marianne Williamson, um, Louise Hay, who started the Hay House. But, the Balboa Press is a self-publishing division, and because I didn't have a manuscript and an agent, I couldn't get into Hay House, so I went in the back door, did it myself, and how I found the Salmon Arm Art Center is I'm a graduate of Salmon Arm, got a lot of family from Salmon Arm, so my grandfather homesteaded in the Salmon Valley, um, my dad still lives in the Salmon Valley, and so um, it was like, well, I'm doing now some book events and want to present and I thought well I should contact the Salmon Arm Art Gallery and there it was serendipitously, fortuitously, intuitively, <laughs> there it was like Kate says well didn't you just pick the right time? <laughs> she didn't say that it was just it was the right time she said I've been curating this show called Dust to Dust and Death and Transition and yes thank you I would love to have you part of it so I'm very grateful Kate, for you to invite me to be part of the visual exhibition, although I don't have any visual work. But um, to talk about the story, the direction that I took with also telling it was what I realized I had done once I was writing the book, and I probably knew it subconsciously, but never really actually wrote it as an as a idea, is that I reframed the story for myself to help me move on to a new life. And the questions that I wanted answered were the why questions. And we'll never know them. That's the mystery. And I, and I just embrace the mystery. We live it. We live it all the time, every day. And the mystery is, is the wonder and the beauty and the joy and the unknowingness of our existence. Um, we think we can plan, but we can't. We think we know, but we don't. Um, when we're open to things, we get answers, but the answers aren't always what we want. And sometimes we have to change our questions because the answers then can present us with something we can live with. And Elizabeth, you said, I'm celebrating my babies with this beautiful piece that you made, right? And that was so, so exquisite. And Jillian, just to hear you describe how you so thoughtfully thought of everything to create the vessels based on, you know, the loss of your, your, your dear friends son um, and then she had lost you know the pregnancy as well so it's like um, I think that when we are able to do this as artists and expressive people and and to give life to our feelings it's so healing and and I think our our jobs are as artists are to share that with others because I just know after going through what I did how people can get stuck in their grief and and to find a way through makes me now feel like I want to be there for others and not in the you know rave the bandwagon or the flag way but just be here subtly for those that you know maybe are touched by my story and Destin's book Leah's Gift is available at the art gallery's front desk and you can hear her read chapter one on our YouTube channel <laughs>